everybody. Welcome to this episode of Trek in Time, where we're going to be talking about the importance of remembering. That's right. We're talking about Enterprise Season 4, Episode 7, The Forge. Welcome to Trek in Time. As you should know by now, if you're a regular listener or viewer on YouTube, we're taking a look at all the episodes of Star Trek in chronological order, which means we've started with Enterprise and we are now, believe it or not, one third of the way through the final season. That's right. It took us 19 years to get here. <laughs> yes. At the rate we're going, we will finish in the year 2152, which means we'll be around to witness the launch of the USS Enterprise. So that's right. Here's to us. Yeah. We're taking a look at each episode in chronological order. We're also taking a look at the world at the time of the original broadcast, which means we are looking at the world as it was in 2004. And with me, I'm Sean Farrell. As some of you may know, I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi, I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matt. Matt is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel, Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How about you? I'm doing okay. I'm looking forward to the conversation around this episode, which I'm going to let the cat out of the bag right here at the top. We don't usually do too much of this with like, how we feel right at the beginning, but I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. I really enjoyed this one mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to the conversation. How about yourself? No, I, I, I did enjoy this one too. It's, this is a fun one. What we typically do before we get into our heavier part of the conversation is we take a look at what you guys have been sharing in the comments on our previous conversations. So Matt, take it away. Got one from Dan Sims on episode 80, the augments, which was the last episode that wrapped up that little story arc with Soong and Brent Spiner. Uh, he said, I was binging the series and really enjoyed the overall season story arc so far, but now I'm watching week to week along with your podcast. So more episodic or short arcs may be nice because it won't make me want to put the next episode on right away as much. <laughs> Sean and I, as we record these episodes, I have that urge. Like when there's like a right into the next one, right into the next one. It's like, oh, I want to watch the next one. And it's like, oh, I don't want to get too far ahead because I want to make sure that it's fresh in my mind when we talk about it. Yeah. It can be a little frustrating. The other comment was from Top Hat who said, I thought you were doing Star Trek The Next Generation. Is there another channel for Star Trek The Next Generation? <laughs> and what went on after that comment was funny. It was between him or her, Top Hat and Pale Ghost. And they were talking about like how long it's going to take us to get to that and what's coming up next. Yeah. And Pale Ghost actually said something that was, uh, maybe if we suddenly start talking into a void when Discovery comes around, we can shave a year and a half off. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's going to take a while. Sean and I were actually just talking before we started recording about how one of the next series we're going to be jumping into is one of the newer ones, which is going to maybe resonate different in a different yeah. way with potential viewers and listeners online. Yeah, there's definitely a peaks and valleys in mm -hmm. in fandom and viewership of the different series and i think that as we move forward it'll be interesting to see what kinds of discussion we're also going to be talking about the the next one after enterprise will be discovery and it will be interesting to be reviewing what the world was like when that originally came out because it is so much more recent than this and then mm -hmm. beyond Discovery and Strange New Worlds, we're going to be jumping back to the late 60s, 1960s. So it's going to be a real slingshot effect in a, it, yeah. at work where we're going to be we're going to be talking about very different eras. But I think it's going to be very interesting to make that transition from 2004 to 2015, 2016, and then back to yep. the 1960s. And I think it's going to be interesting to see some of the similar issues in our world at play. Yes. And yeah, you know, there's going to be some interesting commonalities that yeah. start to come out that we'll start teasing out. Which we might be, be building, fun. we might be building some bridges about uh, what actually does change and, and how much progress might be part of how we view the world as opposed to what's actually happening in the world. So yep. I'm looking forward to that, but thank you for those comments. Those are all great. And, and yeah, top hat, I hope you stick around. I hope you maybe join in and watching some of the programs we're talking about next generation. It's, 
yeah. it's a ways off. It's a ways off. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. It's like ne- I'm a next generation guy yeah. for sure. So yeah. it's like I'm, I cannot wait to get there. Yeah, and Top Hat and Matt, if if it makes you feel any better, the where I plant myself as far as like the the original most, the most core uh, part of my fandom, the original series will always be like number one. But right beneath that is Deep Space Nine. So I have to wait even further yeah. than you guys do. <laughs> Because we got to get through years of next generation. Yeah. And just a little teaser for the listeners. Matt and I have already begun to debate. What do we do with the fact that Star Trek Next Generation and Deep Space Nine overlapped? Or at the same time. They we might had have to be jumping overlap. between episodes. So we might be going back and forth between episodes yes. for those shows. So so hold on. It's going to be a yeah. wild ride. S- strap yourself in. Yeah. Same thing with Discovery. There's a it's big transition in discovery that huge transition I discovery. think is going to make us turn it into a bookends yep. series. So yep, that's all for another day. Cause right now we're going to be focusing on the cause of that sound in the background. That of course is the read alert, which means it's time for Matt to struggle through the Wikipedia description, which oh I will say here in season four, <laughs> I think that there's a little more, pizzazz put into the descriptions they're a little more concise and they're a little better written so matt take it away all right set in the 22nd century the series follows the adventures of the first starfleet starship enterprise registration nx01 in this episode the crew investigates the bombing of the earth embassy on vulcan the evidence led them to suspect a group called the Cyrenites, and captain archer and commander t'pol seek to cross an unforgiving vulcan desert known as the forge to find uh, to find them let me finish that sentence yeah doing a dramatic reading is not gonna help yeah no it's not gonna help meanwhile on the ship the crew discovers that the evidence was planted by elements linked to vulcan high command there we go season four episode seven directed by michael grossman written by judith reeves stevens and garfield reeves stevens a little fun fact about the two of them before writing this together they had not written a star trek script for the series but they were responsible for several novels set Mm -hmm. within the star trek universe so they had been part of the uh they had been part of the creative teams that were responsible for star trek lore so i think that was on full display here the episode originally aired on november 19th 2004 and guest appearances include robert foxworth as administer Vallis, von armstrong in his last appearance as Admiral Forrest, Gary Graham as Ambassador Saval, Michael Riley Burke as Koss, Michael Nuri as Erev, also known as Siren, and Lark Spies as Stell. And I just want to give a quick tip of the hat to Admiral Forrest, Von Armstrong, as we will talk about. This is his last appearance as this character in the series. And I mm-hmm. just wanted to say really quickly, I think he did a terrific job with a character who had to be portrayed as now in a bureaucratic capacity, but understanding the urgency of in the field action and trying to balance Mm -hmm. all of that with a difficult scenario with earth Starfleet issues in balance with the political environment forced upon them by the Vulcan presence. And I always thought that the scenes with him on screen worked really well and i think he and bacula had a good dynamic so i just wanted to point out that his exit in this at this point in the series uh was notable for me Mm -hmm. what was the world like at the time of the original broadcast this of course was november 19th 2004 it is post the u.s presidential election in which president george w bush won re-election over john Kerry. and matt you'll remember that at the time of that election Oh no. There were days where you didn't even know who won the presidential election because you were too busy dancing. Oh, here we go. In your room. And you were, of <laughs> course, dancing over and over to the song over and over. Over and over. By mm-hmm. Nelly featuring Tim McGraw. And we will be revisiting over and over, over and over as we talk for the next few weeks because over and over was the number one song over and over <laughs> until the end of the year. So get ready for more jokes about Matt dancing over and over <laughs> to over and over to over and over, over and over. 
This is like Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo. Buffalo, 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 Buffalo. Buffalo, Buffalo. <laughs> yeah. At the box office, The Incredibles had the number one spot for the second week in a row. It added $50 million to the $70 million that it had in its first week. And it would eventually go on to earn $631 million at the box office. Little, little side note, in my research, I discovered that this was also the week that the SpongeBob movie made its premiere. It made less than The Incredibles, so it did not have the number one spot. But what stood out for me is in that moment, reading that, I thought, dear God, SpongeBob has now been in the popular culture for Mm -hmm. more than a quarter century. And it really kind of like, what? Because I recall when I was a kid watching the Bugs Bunny cartoons, watching Tom and Jerry, and when you recognize that a kid's entertainment has been around as long as it has been, and is still being consumed by new generations of kids. There's something special about that. So yep. in reading about SpongeBob's appearance, I was an adult when Sponge, SpongeBob showed up, but I will admit I loved it. I thought it was great. Mm-hmm. So reading that this was the week that his movie made its first appearance, I thought that was worth noting as well. On television, what was the Enterprise up against? Well, it was up against the Friday night lineup, as we've talked about previously. It was on Wednesday nights originally and then moved to Friday nights, which forced a different kind of storytelling on the show. It was up against shows like Hope and Faith and Complete Savages on ABC, Joan of Acadia on CBS, which had 10 million viewers. Fox was showing Cops, Las Vegas Metro 04. Long title for a show that is effectively just police officers. Yeah. Dateline NBC was looking into women and sexual pleasure, and that got 11 million viewers. So Joan of Arcadia got 10. They got 11. Turns out if you put sex in your title, it's going to work. On UPN, where Star Trek appeared, they received roughly 4 million viewers. And the WB, What I Like About You and Grounded for Life, both also had 4 million. This was a step down in viewership this week from the previous weeks, which I think is interesting. But it's still higher than some of the previous seasons. It's still higher than some of the previous seasons, but that's compared to Friday night viewership where it was previously on Wednesday nights. So it's a different audience that's tuning in Mm -hmm. slightly different because you're probably getting a few more kids who are able to stay up and watch a Friday night show where they couldn't stay up on a Wednesday night. But in comparison to the shows that they're up against, they're still struggling. And they're struggling against yeah. lesser known sitcoms on WB. They're struggling against a show like Cops on Fox. The Friday night lineup was never one that was intended to be the best of the television menu. It was always family focused, kid focused, because the older age demographics aren't home on Friday nights typically. So mm-hmm. the performance here. It being a little weaker than the previous week, I think is interesting because it's sending the message to the showrunners. It's sending the message to the network that when they try to do something a little more cerebral, like this episode, it's not doing as well as the more action oriented stuff of the previous weeks. And even that wasn't performing to a level that anybody wanted. This is a show that in season three had been on the bubble. It got a fourth season being moved and now one third of the way through its season it is still struggling. And when it tries to be the kind of Star Trek that's a little bit smarter and a little bit more about dialogue and discussion, it doesn't do as well as the action stuff. So I think that what we're seeing right now is effectively the beginning of the end for the series. I I have a feeling that at this stage, it wouldn't surprise me if everybody involved knew this is our one shot to kind of like finish this off. Let's finish this series. And Manny Cotto, who had taken over as showrunner at this point, was explicit with these episodes, which is called the Vulcan arc. They were trying to build a bridge between the depiction of Vulcans up to this point in enterprise and the depiction of Vulcans that we know from the original series. What does that mean? These Vulcans have always been a little more emotional. These Vulcans have always been deceitful when it comes to the high command. And these Vulcans have been a little bit more willing to play with subterfuge and deceit in order to keep themselves as a separate removed group. And in the original series, what do we see? 
a lot more emotional repression. Strangely, I mean, it like you'd almost think that it would be the opposite that mm-hmm. you'd end up with less emotional repression in order for them to be fully engaged with Starfleet and being a part of the Federation. But the opposite is true. We see in the future in the original series, Vulcans are far more emotionally withheld. They are fully incorporated into the Federation. And the idea of deceit is non-existent. There, there, yeah. there is not that level of subterfuge. So that's what these episodes are about. What is the bridge between where Enterprise is and where the original series was on the Vulcan question? In the news on this day, November 19th, 2004, what were we talking about? Well, the U.S. had attempted to get the U.N. to draft a treaty banning human cloning. It was abandoned at this point. I just found that interesting because of all our discussions previously around Khan, the augments, yep. and the cloning and eugenic wars that had been part of the episodes that we just talked about. And in Iraq, things continue to not go so well. U.S. military officials reported that 102 soldiers, 85% of which had served in Iraq, Kuwait, and Afghanistan, contracted a rather rare blood infection. Military investigators said there was no evidence of biomedical or biochemical agents in the infections, so there were no concerns about bioweapons being used, but it was still raising questions as to what was happening with these infections. World Vision, one of the last aid agencies left in Iraq, announced it would pull its staff out of the country following the murder of its senior manager. So we were seeing civil society, international civil society, largely abandoning its effort to help build the community, society, and government of a post-war Iraq. And in Baghdad, two people were killed when clashes broke out as Iraqi forces, backed by U.S. troops, entered a popular Sunni mosque to arrest dozens of members, reportedly including the imam. This this is the one story that I think sparked a, a connection for me with this episode because it is so clearly about a small sect in a society and how difference of opinion and difference of action is either framed or presented to the larger community and questions of the veracity of the claims and the actions taken by the minority. This episode in particular focuses on questions of terrorism, insurgencies, and effectively cults. Who who is a terrorist? Who is a, who is a terrorist? (laughs) Who is a cultist? Who is simply a different thinker? What do we do with difference? What do we do with a difference of opinion when it is so fundamentally deep that it actually questions the veracity and validity of government? So we're seeing a story that is depicting Vulcan as a unified society dealing with a heretofore not described insurgency of a group of people who up to this point have not taken any kind of terroristic action, but there is an attack on the earth embassy on Vulcan. And the evidence at first seems to point to this lesser identified group, the Cyrenites. So clearly a storyline pulled out of the context of the world at the time where we were seeing this kind of response from governments. There were so many different instances of governments claiming terrorist organizations responsible for attacks. And then the pushback, the other direction of even going so far as to claim things like 9-11 was an inside job. Like these kinds of debates were in the news constantly at this point. So Matt, the setup of this episode, the beginning of this episode revolves around the scene at the embassy. What did you think about the depiction of the, the buildup to that moment of the attack on the embassy? Uh, this was like, for me, like catnip, like this whole scene, I just ate up. I loved the whole, everything they were establishing because it, it covered so much. It covered the, the setup for the discussion around who's a terrorist. What does that mean to be a terrorist in a society? And <laughs> how that's all structured, but I was also enjoying the, I don't want to call it fan service, but like the building and the kind of like opening up 
that you're starting to see between the Vulcans and the humans. Because the conversation between the Admiral and um, Saval, uh, what, Saval, yeah, is his name, was so like, oh, I love it. It's like I love what they were setting up because it's like the Admiral getting this realization and saying to him, Wait, are, "Are Vulcans afraid of humans?" Yeah. Because the discussion about how Vulcans went the same upheaval in society that humans went through and humans went through it like a hundred years earlier where it took Vulcans, he said, 1500 years to get past that huge upheaval and humans did a hundred. And then the Admiral saying, wait, are you afraid of us? Yeah. Because they're humans are basically evolving as a society much faster than the Vulcans did. And the, the, the admiration that was coming across that conversation of how humans have a blend of Vulcan logic with Andorian fire and like all the different, like there's elements of the different species that are all kind of wrapped up into humanity and it kind of scares Vulcans, yeah. which is part of the reason why he's basically admitting why Vulcans keep trying to stamp down, tamp down the human yeah. speed is because it is a little frightening. And I thought that was such a wonderful display because it shows that there's a real camaraderie building between Saval and the Admiral that there's a respect that's building and it's of course setting up what's going to come with the federation in years to come and i just i think for me i was just like eating that up but then it was also a really good like building block for what happens in the episode so when the explosion happens and the admiral basically saves saval's life it's like that's like the that's like the cherry on top for saval of like he's going to do whatever he can to help the humans out here because like the humans he wouldn't be standing there if it wasn't for the admiral, basically. So it's 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 a very interesting setup for what came after. But my one nitpick, okay, the explosion happens in that room, and the admiral tackles Saval to get him out of the way, and then we go to the special effects shot outside, and it looks like literally a quarter of the building explodes. I actually don't think the explosion takes place in the room where they are. I think that. I think that what happens is they sh they reframe that attack later on when we'll, and we'll get to how they do it. But when they show but, the but evidence, it's, but it's not clear. I think, That's my, but my I, think I think it's that clear. it's, I think that it's taken deeper into the building. And I think that what happens in the lobby, the entryway, which is where they are is splash damage that comes through that area. But I think that ultimately the explosion is depicted a little out of order. I think that the exterior shot showing the first huge explosion, the, the big explosion that takes out a quarter of the building effectively would have taken place seconds before what happened in the lobby. But because of the way that the story has to be told, they show it in the order that they do. So I don't think that. But, but yeah, it's like yeah. you don't you don't hear like the ex a ripple of explosions of it getting closer to them. The way it's portrayed, it looks like the explosion happens in the room and then it shuts, goes outside and like half the building basically evaporates. And it's like, uh, wait, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a. Yeah. I think that the, it didn't, what it I'm did, basing it didn't my, well. what I'm basing my assumption on is that we see the person who's shown to be coming yes. in and planting the bomb has already yes. come through. So he's taken the bomb somewhere else is my interpretation. And so it's like, or maybe there's more than one because we find that there is an unexploded device. So there's more than one device. So maybe they've been brought in over a period of days leading up to this, but whatever the order of it all, I agree with you that the conversation is fantastic. And it's, and it's a discussion between the two of them where I love that it's, you're like this group of people, you're like this group of people, you're like this group of people. And then God damn it. When we think you got, you finished figured out, you act like us. And it's even, it's the whole thing of like, we see ourselves in you, which is making it all the more difficult to know what to do because right. there are glimmers of like, you're utilizing a logic that makes so much sense, but you still got that stubbornness. You still got that Andorian streak. You still got that Klingon attitude. The, and I liked, I liked that it was, as you mentioned, it's fan servicey, but it's fan service that works because yep. if they'd been like, you're like the Google flexes, like we would have been like, what? Like who? Yeah. Like, so the kind of references that they're using have to be used the way they're using them. So it's very smart. I really liked it. And it does show the kind of years of developing relationship between Forrest and Saval. And Saval at this point has even had this kind of moment with Archer. So it's the development mm -hmm. of a character who started off with, you guys shouldn't fly. 
you shouldn't go anywhere. You need to stay on your planet and figure your stuff out. And now he's like, we're recognizing you to a large degree do have your stuff figured out. And that's what's so perplexing and scary to us that we aren't sure how you're managing to do this. And what does it mean when you go deeper into space? Mm -hmm. And the, I love that Forrest's response is we want to be your partners. Like, yep. because he's effectively, Saval is hinting at like, what if humans decide that it's conquest? What if it's the fact that humans decide, okay, we just need to start taking over terrain. And Forrest's response is we're talking about being partners. And of course, as the fan, you're sitting there like the Federation, yep. like equality within representation in the Federation. We know what's coming. So we're sitting there like, yeah, Forrest has got it. Saval's fear is potentially. And like, if you try and take Saval's perspective, you can understand where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. So I think that's good writing is that he's not saying you guys have been, and then making claims that are unfounded. He's simply saying like, we are perplexed and we're worried as a result of that. So we have the yep. attack and then begins the investigation. And here again is where Saval's role I think is beautifully used. Mm -hmm. He sends the message to Archer question everything. Don't, don't let the high command make claims without double checking it yourself. He's already got, for whatever reason, his, something is, is hitting him the wrong way. He's like, this doesn't make sense for it to have been the Cyrenites alone. And the high command presents evidence, which once it's looked at a little deeper, is determined to have been falsified. That includes DNA of Tapau, which is a name that all of us who grew up in the eighties will recall was a great band, but <laughs> it was also the name of the head Vulcan priestess who is involved in the episode of mock time when Spock is returned to Vulcan for the entire wedding ceremony episode that revolves around him and his, mm -hmm. and his, fiance and Kirk and Spock have to fight one of the best episodes to come out of the original series. I think to was a major figure in that and here her name being dropped and the potential of seeing to for the first time within enterprise is very interesting because it's depicting her as a member of a group known as the Cyrenites who are following the teachings of the first Klingon to wander Maybe. what? Vulcan, Vulcan, the first Vulcan to wander <laughs> into. <laughs> if it was a Klingon, yeah. that would be a, There's a wild, very different story. Wild episode. <laughs> we find out that the that the origin of Vulcan logic is all because of a Klingon. <laughs> Kapla. <laughs> so it's the the teachings of Sirach, which come out of his having wandered into the desert in the section known as the Forge. And Siren, as a follower of Sirach more recently, this is now Sirach's wandering into the desert is depicted as 1500 years ago, Vulcan was tearing itself apart. And this one guy went into the desert and he came back out with these teachings that helped us figure out what to do. And he remains the cornerstone of Vulcan philosophy and thinking and ultimately lifestyle because yeah. of his teachings. And there is a lot of empty spaces because his original writings have been lost. His original teachings have been interpreted in different ways. And so we have a form of Sirach's teachings, which are on display on the large scale, which this group of Cyrenites claim they've been manipulated. They've been twisted in certain ways and they aren't actually accurate. And the Serenites claim that the original teachings of Sirach have been discovered. And it eventually, as we'll find in the episode, isn't even fully about the writings of Sirach. It's about his Katra itself. This is where we're seeing now a depiction of Vulcan philosophy and the, the meta Vulcan storytelling of all of Star Trek has been pulled mm -hmm. on in beautiful ways to really bring it all together into these, these moments. I think that some of the exterior shots where some CGI is used to create yep. statuary where you see Siren and his first journey 
it's it's shown as 50 years ago he is wandering through the desert and finds what looks like a small it it simply looks like a small cave with some statuary and he's polishing these things off and seeing what they say and he seems to find something that is the thing it's a kind of raiders of the lost ark moment of like the swell of the music and the importance of the discovery all of the depiction of this is beautiful for especially for a tv series but it's very closely rendered in comparison to some of the things we've seen in the other series. I mentioned a mock time before a mock time, original series, star Trek set building set design is very different from what is being done in enterprise, yep. but it, it hits the right notes, the color of the sky, the color of the sand, the terrain, the descriptions of the harsh atmosphere, the difficulty to sustain yourself when the temperatures are as high as they are, the concern that T'Pol has for Archer, who will not be able to sustain them as well. All of that is beautifully rendered. I'm thinking about scenes from some of the movies where you see Spock on his, in the original motion picture, he's shown as being on a pilgrimage through the forge. This is where he is going. He is doing this attempt to cleanse himself of the last of his human side, the emotional side. He is pursuing that in this place. So it is, this is the Mecca of Vulcan thought and because of the harsh terrain. And I like the fact that they, they depict it as this is where he went to kind of get away from all the distraction of Vulcan tearing to an itself apart. Inhospitable place. But it makes <laughs> sense if you think about it logically, yes. because It was at a time when this kind of pursuit might have been dangerous for Serac. So for Serac to go to a place where people wouldn't be able to find him makes sense. And then that underscores for the followers of Siren why they're safe also going to the same place. This is a place that you don't go there if you don't want to get away from it all. So they're there. And there's a lot of beautiful uh, references that pull from all these other Vulcan stories throughout all of Star Trek that I really, really liked. Yeah. I'm glad you called out that some of the writers had worked in the novels because that's one of the things I really respected of this episode. This could have easily fallen down into fan service territory, all of this, but they didn't. It was, they went to like, here's the thing that would have been fan service. They went to layer down, found the, the root of what the society would have been like and they teased it back through its history so it's like you it felt very authentic mm-hmm. for the story and the environment and the world building they were doing and i i wanted to call out the special effects in this episode i thought were excellent yeah i mean some of them are some of them are dated so you have to keep in mind that this was yeah. early 2000s but like the scene where they're running through the forge at night and they're being hunted by that animal there's this one shot like shaky cam running with the two of them facing the camera running in the background, this giant beast is like skidding around a corner and coming at them. And I was like, holy crap, that looks like anything you'd see in any modern show today. It's like doing special effects where the camera is bouncing the way it was really hard to pull off what they pulled off and they did it. And I was just like, wow, man, that was like out of a movie. And this was made in the early two thousands on probably a shoestring budget. And so I was just like, for a show that's a on the bubble, job. as the great budget job. continues to get smaller as a result of being on the bubble, they do a lot of yeah. stuff here. And I think that it's part of perhaps why episodes like The Augments didn't have quite as much um, in the way of costume design that, you know, yeah. we kept complaining that like, it looks like they're doing things that don't make a lot of sense. Like maybe they were saving some dollars so they could invest it in this. I'm glad you mentioned the Salat. I wanted to talk about that in particular, because that for me, here comes the fanboy like in <laughs> yes. Sean on full display. What can I just pause for a second before you go into this? Yeah. For those of you who don't know, Sean is, I think as a, my memory of you as a kid, Sean, you wanted to be Spock. I taught myself to be able to raise one eyebrow simply because Spock could do it. And Spock was for me, the character who was to be emulated. I liked, I, I loved Kirk. You know, Kirk was great. Like, there he goes. He's getting, he's ripping off that shirt and he's getting into that fist fight again. That's fantastic. Uh, and he's got that swagger, which I always liked, but I liked Spock for the quiet demeanor, the standing in the background and being ready when somebody calls on you to do what needs to be done. But, 
not looking for all that attention. That was, that was my bag. So for me, the fan service around like really talking about Vulcans Mm -hmm. as an atmosphere, as an environment, I wanted to read from Wikipedia, like the description of the animal that Matt just mentioned, which is a salat and why this hit the note for me as I'm watching the episode. I remember it from the first viewing in 2004. I remembered it in just memory. When I think about Star Trek and when I think about Spock's home and I think about Spock's story, for me, this is a huge moment for Enterprise to have brought something that was always debated about whether it was canon, bringing it fully into the canon, and that is Mm -hmm. the Salat. The CGI Salat was based on one which had previously appeared in the Star Trek animated series episode Yesteryear. Visual effects Mm -hmm. producer Dan Curry said that the team looked at the animated series and it just looked nice and pleasant. So I did a couple of sketches to to do a reinterpretation of it to make it look scary, but not too radical a departure from the original. Eden FX modeled the CGI under supervision of staff visual art supervisor, Art Corden. Additional care was taken to create the fur so that close-ups could be used if required. The only physical portion of the Salat to be created was a single paw. Yesteryear from the animated series was set in the Vulcan city, Shakar, which appears in the forge and is also the first mention of the area on Vulcan called the forge. A further reference was made to Vulcan's forge in the Deep Space Nine episode, Change of Heart. The original series... The spinoff Saturday morning cartoon, the animated series, had this episode yesteryear in which you get a time travel story in which Spock travels back in time to become the family member that he remembers from his childhood who helped him at a particularly difficult time in his life. The Salat is introduced in that episode as a family pet. It looks like effectively a gigantic tiger that is living in the home and Spock as a child loves this creature takes care of it. And in the animated episode, the character, the creature dies as a result of defending young Spock from another animal. So for them to have gone and introduced that animal in this episode is effectively taking something that had been debated. Is this considered canon? Is the animated series actually storylines of Kirk and his original crew? And this episode in one simple swoop of putting this big animal in the background as the threat they did it does it it takes all of that and makes it part of the canon which i loved i loved the cgi here i loved the the use of the animal and really again and again it is this is not a spot a, a hospitable place to be vulcan is not an easy planet to survive on and it really kind of hammers again and again and again the resilience of the vulcan people we've only seen vulcans in enterprise who seem to be nefarious when it comes mm-hmm. to the Vulcan government. We see nefarious action and we see it on display here in the form of them giving falsified evidence to earth in order to depict that the attack was coming from the Serenites. So we have Archer and T'Pol go into the wilderness. They come across this animal. It chases them up a hill. T'Pol very casually says it might hunt us for days, at which point Archer is left to wonder, what do we do now? And in the distance, a, another Vulcan makes a falsified roar, sort of a la Obi-Wan Kenobi showing up to save Luke from the Sand People, scares off the Salat, and they come down. And this Vulcan claims, he originally claims that he is somebody else. He uses a name which means Desert Wind, a Rev. And then he eventually is revealed to be Siren. He is the he is the Siren of the Sirenites. And his depiction of a Vulcan, Matt, did you notice what I noticed about his depiction of a Vulcan? Namely, he felt more like a Vulcan than most of the Vulcans yes. we see earlier in Enterprise. This is yes. a Vulcan depiction that to me was like, this could be Sarek. This could be Spock's father. Right. You know, I got, the, I definitely got that feeling and it, it felt very deliberate that he was very familiar as a Vulcan, like a Spock-like a character that showed up because he was it, it came across that he wasn't denying his emotions and he was but he was still remaining very calm mm-hmm. and logical about everything but you could tell that there was stuff bubbling under the surface and he wasn't trying to hide it or repress it mm-hmm. it was just it just felt like it was there 
And I love the dialogue between him and the captain, how he was probing the captain of like, you know, why don't you recite the, 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 yeah. you know, the meaning of this. And the captain's like, oh yeah, we haven't gotten to that. Yeah. Like it was like, and him picking up and like, you're, you're a complete liar. Yeah. Um, and we don't lie. You know, I followed the teachings and we don't lie. Yeah. I just, I love that aspect of it. It's like, okay, here's the true Vulcan, especially when he was saying, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's not going to happen. And it's something that we've seen again and again over the course of this series. So it was a really nice kind of, um, you can see that the, they were clearly setting up that the Cyrenites are not terrorists, yeah. that they are the true Vulcans and that it's something else has been going on for in the government and society at large that has perverted what we as fans know of Vulcan. Yeah. So it, it, they were very being very, I, I don't want to say it was definitely not ham fisted at all, yeah. but it was, it was pretty obvious what they were setting up. It was, there was no subtlety to it. It was just coming right out and basically saying it almost immediately, Yeah, but it, it needed to be done. And it's, because a, yeah, I agree. It it's not ham fisted. And it's also speaking of the era that was, the show was being made in at the time. There were constant refrains about what does it mean to be a terrorist? What is yep. a terrorist? And those people who would say, well, a terrorist is a Muslim and the constant messaging coming out of more open-minded circles was you can't take a group of people who are relying on distorted versions of religious teachings and throw an entire group of people under the bus as a result of that, mm -hmm. because ultimately every religious teaching that exists has been used and manipulated and distorted at different times. And that includes every major religion. Every major religion has done things that are terrible under the name of their religion as the result of distortions of teachings. So that is being now fictionalized using the Vulcans, but it was on full display as questions about who to trust in Iraq, in Afghanistan, who, mm -hmm. who, where do these sources of disruption come from? And even questions in the U S pre nine 11, we had attacks from the Oklahoma city bombing. There are members of organizations in this country who carry out bad acts and they do it in the name of major religions that are not Islam. They, they have all sorts of different groups behind them that even in the name of what would be considered from a U.S. perspective, a mainstream religion, a distorted teaching is a distorted teaching. And that's kind of where this has all been steeped. It feels like it's very of the moment and saying, we can't let the structure that is scared of original sources dictate how those original sources are interpreted. Yep. So we're seeing that on display in the pursuit of Archer on Vulcan with T'Pol looking for the Cyrenites to see what the relationship, if any, between the attack and the Cyrenites is. At this point, Archer is already fully aware of the fact that evidence has been doctored. So... He's going there in pursuit of what is the cause of the distrust more than what is the causal link between the Cyrenites and the attack. Can I just call it one thing about the, the doctor and trip, um, and the ambassador on enterprise when they're discussing the additional things that the flocks had found, like there were additional cells we found and yeah. it's the cells are clearly old and doctored calling out the director and the cinematographer on this episode, there was some really odd close-ups that entire scene <laughs> that were like looking up people's nostrils and it was like what the hell is going on here it was like did somebody just want to do something dramatic and didn't understand how to do a close-up because it was just like everybody was shot like so close up we found extra cells <laughs> it was just like it was ridiculous. My wife was sitting there with me watching this episode and she just started laughing. She was just like, what's up with the close-ups?" And I was like, I know, right? <laughs> was the first thing that was going through my head. It's this episode did feel a little like, you know how sometimes when they film movies, there's like a crew and the B crew that's yeah. filming secondary stuff. It felt like was the B crew filming this episode while they were outside filming the stuff in the desert because that stuff was awesome. And this stuff is kind of like, oh, what? what's going on here <laughs> from a cinematographic perspective i get what you're saying but i think that what's yeah. happening on the ship as far as the conversations are concerned i oh, actually really no enjoyed complaints. all of that yes flocks as the evidence gatherer trip is trying really hard to balance now being in command of the enterprise and working yep. with saval they've had their issues in the past 
But at this point, Saval is making very clear again and again and again. He's like, I, I'm on the path of looking for the truth. I'm looking for evidence with you. Well, the f- I mean, the fact that he did the mind meld. He does it's the like mind that's meld. That's something that's yeah. taboo. And he, he initially didn't want to do it, but then he's like, I want to help. So he did it. And then the other comment, the commentary, the little conversation they had where he, they were going to be transporting people down to the surface yeah. with the captain. And great scene. Saval gives them that that memory card that has a location and a way to do it so that they won't be detected. Yeah. And Trip says some comment about like, aren't you going to get in trouble for this? And he's just like, I don't, I don't see know anything there but a memory card. I just yeah. see a memory card thing. I thought that was an, a nice little like touch as well. Yeah. And uh, during the cell conversation, during the extreme close ups, there was a, a a moment where I think it was the ambassador said it was when he said, here's here's the thing, how to get past the defenses. <laughs> My wife was started laughing and, went, and said, well, he's been corrupted by humans. Yeah. <laughs> was, was her response. But I did find it funny because it's like in a way he is in that mindset of the non Serenite crowd, even though he's helping the Serenites and, but through his actions, yeah. he's, he's lying. And that's something that Vulcans aren't supposed to do. Right. And he's basically saying, I'm willing to lie. So it's like, he clearly doesn't follow the teachings and the way he's supposed to in the way he's helping. So it's, it's, I just thought that was kind of an interesting like nuance to what they were doing with his character. Yeah. The result of a corrupt entity is that sometimes the corrupt entity will have its own members become corrupt against it. So if that, yep. so that's like what you're talking about is a destabilized government is now beginning to crumble because members of its own functioning are turning and working against it. So it can't sustain mm-hmm. itself. We have all of those nice moments on the enterprise with Saval. And again, I, this is a character that, by design, they put him into antagonist territory at the very beginning. And we've seen the slow drip, drip, drip of, of him turning into an ally. And now we see it in full force. Mm-hmm. It's he's benefited by some very good makeup showing a large green scar and scab wound on his face as he has been injured in the attack. His willingness to conduct a mind meld, which in previous episodes, the discussion of mind meld was always, it is a Not only is it a taboo thing, it is a thing that only a small portion of people can do. And on the planet, Siren reveals mind melds are a Vulcan's birthright. We can all do it. He's like laying out like this is not a thing that is intended to be taboo. And here, I think for me, it is the unspoken in the episode or in the at this point in the discussion. I think there's a, a question of like, what would the taboo around that be? And I think that the heart of it is the very thing that happens between Siren and Archer, which is it's about the Katra. It's about going to primary sources for your information. If Vulcan society had evolved along the lines of mind melds are part of our birthright and they are part of the way that we are ensured that we are standing on the bedrock of the teachings of the wisest, you get there through mind melds. So you end up with a society, if mind melding is considered part of life and part of teaching, then the original teachings, the original writings of Surak are not needed because mind melding would get you there by controlling right. mind melding and making it a taboo and making the argument that it is something that only a few strange well, aberrant individuals can do. You're maintaining well, control well, of the written text, which is what the well, Vulcan well, high command is trying to do. Well, with mind melds, there's no lying. Right. It's like you're, you're, it's a two way street. It's not like you reading somebody else's mind. It's they can read your mind at the same time. You know, our minds become one. So you're bearing your soul to somebody else and they can, they can, they know who you are, you know who they are. And of course, a, a repressive regime would want to stop that because yeah. <laughs> you know that they're lying to you. So there are two things left that I want to discuss very quickly. One is to Paul's mother. We've seen her previously as Joanna Cassidy portrayed her in the episode around the betrothal. Mm-hmm. She through to Paul's husband sends her an idic necklace, which is infinite diversity in infinite, infinite combination. And he presents it to Paul as your mother said, this was an old family heirloom and to Paul takes it and very graciously says, mm-hmm. and then later is just like, I'd never seen this before in my life. Mm-hmm. I, 
I loved the subterfuge and the inclusion of her mother in the Serenite movement. I loved the use of the husband as the basically ignorant go between. I love the yep. use of the special effects around the necklace showing a map of this is mm -hmm. the location where we are. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was the final moments between Siren and Archer. They're hiding in the cave from a storm. Very nicely depicted. I liked the fleeing from the storm. I like the idea that the storm is like, it's so electrically charged. It's not even about, it's the wind, it's the sand. It's literally like this storm just shoots out electric charges as lightning that is so lethal that one hit is enough. They're hiding in this cave. And when Siren is struck and knows he is dying, he pulls the old Spock out of the radioactive chamber maneuver. Yeah, remember. And plants a <laughs> hand on Archer and says something which Archer does not understand. And then when Archer wakes up and Siren is dead and T'Pol is like, what happened? And all Archer can say is, I feel like he hit me. Mm -hmm. And he reveals the word that was said and the word was remember. And so we have now the Katra transition fans of the series, fans of the movies. We see what's coming. It's like, Oh, it's the whole Spock into McCoy McCoy then goes kind of bonkers and is like doing things yeah. that are beyond his, his understanding so that we can have the search for Spock and Spock can be returned, blah, 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 blah. That's all in the movies, but we know it. So here we are and we know what's going to happen to Archer and how did you feel about the ways that they, they depicted the beginning of Archer's manifestations of Siren? Oh, it was, it was, I liked it. This is just me being a little overly critical. I thought it was a little on the nose because it's like, you know, Chekhov's gun. If you, if you show something, it has to have a purpose later mm -hmm. with like the whole, they're in the, the desert and the Vulcans are going to say, and like, you know, I can go for days without water and, and the captain's like downing it. And then there's that comment that he says later of when they're going, he's like, says to T'Pol, don't worry, I can go for days. And mm -hmm. she says, uh, no, you can't. You're human. Yeah. <laughs> you need water. It's like those little like seeds that were dropping of this is not normal Archer anymore. And it's just clear to the viewer because we all know Ratha Khan and all that kind of stuff of the whole remember thing with Spock. Mm -hmm. So it was like I said, on the nose, but totally enjoyable. Yeah. Like I liked, I liked the way they set it up. And I also like that this was the end of the episode yeah. because we know what this means as a viewer, as a Star Trek fan, you know exactly what this means. And there's of course a, oh crap about what's about to unfold just from that. Yeah. So it did a good, I think it did a good job of hooking us to want to find the next episode and see what, what, what happens. Yeah. I think that I agree with you. It is on the nose, but it's thoroughly enjoyable. And I liked, I actually really liked the, no, I'm, I'm okay. I won't need that for weeks. And yeah. her, like, you're an idiot. You're a human. What are you talking about? And then yeah. him walking through a stone wall and knowing yep. like, I know where I am and I can get back to these people and yep. his warning to her of like, don't fight back. Like we're going to be okay. If you just do what I tell you, his operating on instinct, I think is nicely done. And it's a speeding up of what we saw previously in the movies where the movies depicted as you have Spock's death and then you have weeks going by before McCoy begins to exhibit strange behavior that sounds like he's making speeches to Kirk saying like, why have you abandoned me? And it's that questioning of like, how long does it take? Well, in this, it takes literally no time at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine with that. Like this story yeah. has to move forward the way it does. So I really enjoyed all of that. I thought it was really, really nicely done. So next time we're going to be talking about part two of the Vulcan arc, which is the awakening. Here we are now in the second of a multi-part little mini story arc. And I have to say, I'm really kind of enjoying having a season broken up in this way. If they're not going to do yes. the overall story arc of like, we got to go stop the Zindi and they're not going to do serialized like episodic, like different monster each week. This is a really nice middle ground. I, and I think they've done a really good job with it. We weren't so crazy about the whole con type eugenics storyline of the previous story arc, 
but I think as a whole, it demonstrated a smart approach to the storytelling. And now we're seeing yes. it beginning here with another well, multi-story arc. One new nuance of that for me was the previous story arc didn't have a relevant impact on this show. You know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't have a ramp impact on what's going to happen for us this season. This story arc is, it's like, it is another little brick in the, the wall that's being built that's going to happen by the finale. So yeah. it's like, even though it's not an overarching storyline, it's still adding an element that's going to pay it forward later. Yeah, I agree. So before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you'd like to remind our listeners about? Uh, just to stay tuned to Undecided, there's some good videos coming up on everything from the new laser fusion breakthrough that just happened to updates on building a factory built energy efficient net zero energy home, which is what I'm doing. Um, I've got a lot of interesting videos coming up. As for me, I just want to point out, as usual, you can go to my website, look for my books there. It's seanfarrell.com. You can also go to your local bookstore or your public library and find my books that way. And I just wanted to call out that I have a new book, which is coming out, which is the sinister secret of singe. And the sinister secrets of singe is the first book of a, at this point, two book series, but it's for middle grade readers. And I hope people might be interested in checking that out. It's available for pre-order. Now it's coming out in June, but if you put in an order now, it definitely helps with helping the book get a bigger splash. So I would thank anybody with any kind of interest in my writing for going and looking for that. If you'd like to support this show, please consider reviewing us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it was you found this, go back there, leave a review. You can always share us with your friends. That's always a great way to help us. And you can become a subscriber. And don't forget, if you want to become a direct supporter, you can go to trekintime.show, click on the become a supporter button, it allows you to throw some coins at our heads. We appreciate it. And when you do that, it makes you an ensign, which means you will start getting our spinoff show out of time in which we talk about things that don't fit within the confines of this show. So we talk about Star Trek, but we don't worry about the being in the right order. So we'll talk about new, right. new series. We'll talk about new episodes. We'll also talk about things like Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, whatever pasts our fancy. We've recently talked about the show Willow which was a big conversation that we enjoy. And when you subscribe, you will automatically start getting out of time in your feed. All of that really does help support the show. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening or watching. And we'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.